The Ministry of Secondary Education has developed a distance learning platform for students of secondary education in Cameroon. A series of lessons taught by qualified teachers for secondary school students. Under the stewardship of Professor Pauline Nalovalyonga, in collaboration with the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications, CAMTEL, CRTV and UNESCO. We are introducing distance learning as another teaching and learning method which is different from the traditional classroom setting that you are all used to. In the distance education mode, you are not with the teacher in person, so take your time, relax, listen to the teacher, take down notes and visit the following links for any questions or answers to your questions. Take it in your stride. This is Cameroon's solution to COVID-19 and beyond. Professor Nalova Lyunga, Minister of Secondary Education. Hello, student. You're welcome. Welcome to uh, lessons today on philosophy in the distance learning platform. And um, Sintun Basilis to take you today for our class on lower six philosophy. And today we shall focus on the, the ninth lesson. Before we begin with the lesson today, let's begin with by correcting the assignments I gave in our previous class. And in our previous class, I asked you to define eudaimonism and state its principle. Now, the answer we have here is eudaimonism comes from the Greek word eudaimonia, translated as the good spirit or simply happiness. It was developed in a systematic way by Aristotle and holds that happiness is the ultimate aim of human act. It is, it, is, it is based on the principle of the theology, which states that everything or every man act has a purpose. And to this view, he concluded that the ultimate end, that end that when human beings attain, they don't seek for other things else, is happiness. And to him, this is even the end of politics, called the common good of the state. The aim of politics is to pro pro produce or to ensure that happiness is attained at the, at the level of the state. Now, our lesson today is going to focus on the morality of abortion. And here, we we'll begin by looking at the various articulations of the, of the lessons, the various uh, the structure, the lesson plan. We'll look at the objectives of the lesson. We'll now connect the, lesson, the previous knowledge to our lesson. We'll examine the problem situations, and then we will we'll now engage into the lesson activity proper from where you have some exercises to answer, questions to answer. And then I'll give you the take home assignment to see how you can also go at home and match the lesson to the difficulties I'll give to you. Now, for the objectives of the lesson, in the first place, at the end of this lesson, you students should be able to state the conditions of being a person or personhood, because the question of abortion is also the question of what? Of the personhood of the fetus, is the fetus a person or not? You should be able to define and differentiate between the types of abortion. You should be able to evaluate the pro-choice approach to the morality of abortion. The pro-choice and also think that the woman has a choice to decide on whether to abort or not. Now, you should be able to also judge the pro-life approach to the morality of abortion because to the pro-life approach, you know, we have to protect life at all costs and they are against the fact that abortion should be morally acceptable. <laughs> Now, for the previous knowledge, I, this is what I, I know you have now that will help us to be able to understand the lesson of today. You can already state the various ethical theories and their principles. That's what we saw in, that, in our previous class. Now, we now examine the problem situation to see the usefulness of the lesson to you, the student. How can this lesson help you to solve your daily life problem? Now, I did the problem situation. Your aunt, who is old, has tried several times and gone to many hospitals to conceive, to, but to no avail, that she tries to have a child to no avail. She finally conceives, but unfortunately, the fetus is lodged, but in the fallopian tube, we call it ectopic pregnancy, <coughs> instead of the womb. If she, swap, if she allows the child to grow there, that is in the fallopian tube, so she may die, and if she insists to eliminate the fetus, she will go against the commandment of God, which says, Thou shall not kill. That is a problem situation. Question. That, that is, this is the second. Now, I prefer we examine the two situations, then we look at the questions that follow. Now, this is another situation now, another problem situation. Your classmate has just become pregnant as a result of rape carried out 
someone she does not know, someone rapes, rapes your classmate. She is the only child that her poor parents have struggled to sponsor, and they are hoping very optimistically that she will be she will be the, redeem, the redeemer or the person who can save the family from poverty, chain upon the graduation of, from college and picking up a job. Now, this problem situation too, keeping the pregnancy will remain an end to her education, for she will drop out of school, and this will, will, will be what? Total frustration for the entire fa family and the question that follow are, what pieces of advice will you give to each of them in order to help them to come out from this dilemma. You have seen the two problems they presented, and these are problems that we encounter them every day, and the lesson can help us overcome them. We see that at the end of the lesson. Now, the first, in the first place, we are going to look at the definition of abortion. And here, abortion can be defined simply as the termination of the life of the human fetus before delivery. That is the, 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 the the, the, thing, the thing in the womb is called the fetus. People, some call it as you, that's a human being. Others say it's not yet a human being. But abortion has to occur before delivery. And if it's after delivery now, it becomes what we call infanticide, killing an infant. It is then an intentional or a forceful ending of the life of an unviable human fetus. And then we have philosophers like Edwin Haley. He differentiates between two types of abortion. Direct abortion or indirect abortion. Direct abortion is somewhat voluntary, and here it can occur at two levels. It can be a means to achieve other ends. For instance, people who abort and use babies for experiments in laboratories in advanced countries, they use it as means to an end. Now, it can be an end, like the end, your aim actually is to abort. You're aborting because that is the objective. That is, whether it is a means to an end or an end, what is clear is that it is voluntary. We call it direct abortion. We also have what we call indirect abortion, where the loss of the fetus is simply a secondary effect or simply involuntary abortion. That is, for instance, medically assisted abortion or what we call therapeutic abortion, where if, like the case we presented in the following situation, if the child is allowed to grow in the fallopian tube, the mother will die. The aim of aborting here is not to kill the fetus, but to save the mother's life, and that's why we call it involuntary abortion. Now, we are going to examine now the pro-choice as their view on and the pro-abortionism because the problem here is, is, is abortion morally justifiable? But let's understand what the pro-choice are, who actually they are. They are those who defend the primacy or the supremacy of the woman's right over the right of the potential person, the fetus, because the fetus is not yet a human being, it's still a potential, it's still to become a person. To them, everyone has the basic right to decide when to have children or not. A woman has a right over her body, they call it a body autonomy. Denying her abortion is denying her the right to her bodily autonomy or her freedom to use her body the way she wants. And then for the pro-choice, pro-lifers or anti-abortionism, to them, the life of everyone matters whether you are a pre-born, a newborn, an elderly person, or someone with disabilities or special needs, your life is worth protecting. All human life is correct, is created equal, and thus no one has to take away the life of the other person. This is a view of anti-abortionism. Now, the, the question now is, is abortion morally justifiable? Can we um, use moral principles to, to justify the practice of abortion? Now, we look at the arguments of the pro-choice, the pro-choice argument, or simply the pro-abortionist or pro-abortionism. Now, the first argument is the argument from the fetus lack of personality, because to these philosophers, they argue that the fetus may be human, but not yet a human person, not yet a person. Absolute pro-abortionists even argue that there is no life before birth. That is before the child is born, he's not yet alive, not yet alive, he's not, he's not a human person. That is, what exists in a womb is just a bunch of cells, cells that have been joined together. Now, in, the, in, in this article, the personhood argument in favor of uh, abortion and on moral and legal status of abortion, that is, uh, we have this, this lady, Mary Ann Warren, that's an American philosopher, draws a distinction between a human being and a person. A human being are those who are genetically classified as a species of the Homo sapiens and may 
or may not be a person because we also have the, the uh, human beings who are still potential person because they have not yet obtained the full criteria. What because he's going to, she's going to give us the criteria of being a person, the conditions that a thing should fulfill to be called a human person. And uh, 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 about the person, he says, human beings in a moral sense are bearers of rights and always merit our consideration and respect. Many human beings are not members of the moral community simply by virtue of their humanity, because you can be a human, you can be human, but not yet a person. Persons, however, have rights. If you don't yet have rights, you're not yet a person that must be respected, including the right to life. Mary Ann Warren enumerates five criteria of defining um, a person, and the first thing is consciousness. Is the fetus conscious or not? To, to her, the fetus is not conscious. The second one is reasoning. Is the, is the fetus reasoning? Can the fetus make some decisions and, and deliberations against some actions? The answer is no to her. The fetus is not reasoning. The other one is self-motivating activity. Does the fetus intentionally engage into some activities that show that she has a purpose or he has a purpose to, to attend? The answer is no. And, that, and therefore, the fetus is not yet a person. The capacity to communicate. Does the fetus engage into interpersonal communication? The answer is no. The presence of uh, self concepts. Does the, does the fetus have, for instance, a particular uh, vision of the world? The answer is no. And with these five characteristics, she concludes that the fetus is not a human being and therefore it can be aborted. Now we come to the second argument, the argument from the superiority of the mother's right over the fetus. And here we talk of the principle of voluntariness. In this argument, there is a distinction between a full person, a woman, and a potential person, that is the fetus. The fetus bed is then a product of the woman's choice to compromise her rights and her bodily security because, it, because the woman is one to decide whether the fetus is born or not. And if she, there are two things here, she has the conflict between what? Either allowing herself to enjoy, for instance, the freedom of her body and her rights, or to let the fetus to grow in her womb so that it can be born to become a human being. And if she let, allows the fetus to be born, she has compromised with her rights and her bodily security. This is called the bodily a, 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 a autonomy argument. The mother has a right over her body. Now we have Brian, Brian McKinley. This is what he has to say about uh, the argument of the conflict between the rights of the woman and the rights of the fetus. In the case of the pregnant woman giving a right to life to the potential person in the womb, automatically cancels out the mother's right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That is, the fact that the mother is a full person, her rights overshadow the rights of a potential person because the fetus is a potential person and not yet a full person. Therefore, the rights of the mother overshadow the rights of the fetus. And as such, it is morally correct to abort the fetus to allow the mother's right to continue to be recognized. We have the, 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 the third argument, the ethical adoption of Aristotle's hilomorphism. Hilomorphism is simply the theory of matter and form, where Aristotle argued that there is no formless matter and no matterless form. That is, matter cannot exist without form, and form cannot exist without matter. He went ahead to argue that the body is matter, and that the soul is the form of the body. The adoption of the, of the Aristotelian hilomorphic theory, even through Thomas Aquinas, that a human person is made of a body and soul in order for a person, for, for a human soul to exist, the body must be proportionate to the rational soul. That is, if the body is not yet developed, then the soul also is not also fully, is not fully present. And the fetus does not have a fully developed body, therefore the rational aspect of the, is not also present in the fetus. The body can only have a rational soul much later in pregnancy when the basic biological basis of rationality have developed. If the, if, the, if the nervous system, the brain, is not fully developed, then the, the, the fetus cannot reason. And cannot reason, then we cannot talk of the presence of the soul, since we equate reason to the soul. So early in pregnancy, the human embryo or the fetus is not human, not a human person. Thus, a woman has a right to do away with it. 
and expression of her right and the, and the autonomy over her body. Now, we also have the fourth argument, which is the utilitarian approach. We call it the principle of the higher good. To these philosophers here, it is the usefulness of an act. That is the ability of an act to, such as to give happiness to the highest number of persons that makes your act to morally acceptable. They, they, they have even appealed to the principle of any, that any action that on a balance has a better consequence is morally permissible. If pregnancy causes pains to the highest number of persons, then it is wrong to keep the pregnancy. Among the consequences that might justify an abortion, they have suggested uh, are the following. Abortion can be committed in a case where we want to avoid the financial burden. If it is proven, for instance, that the fetus is going to be, a, a, that is a person, a, a defective child who is sick, continuously sick of a kind of a fatal illness, and will be a financial burden to the family, then, according to this principle of the, of the satisfaction of, higher, of the highest number of persons, the child is useless and thus is possible to, to abort. Or it can be in a case where you want to avoid disgrace of the family, and so on and so forth. And that's why I've mentioned here that if the fetus is sick of a fatal illness and is draining the finances of the family, then why keep it? If she is potentially a defective child, that will be a permanent psychological and financial burden to the family, why keep the, the fetus when the high number of persons are going to be in pain because of an in, a single individual? And then we proceed to the fifth argument, which is the natural law ethics you have here, the principle of double effect. Now, the double effect was, was formulated by Aquinas in his summer theologica in discussing self-defense. To him, nothing hinders one act from having two effects, only one of which is intended, while the other is besides the intention. For instance, it is possible to have some acts with two effects positive effect and negative effects, that is, but your intention should be the positive effect, even though that positive effect cannot happen without a negative effect coming through. And then, for instance, in the act of self-defense, we may have two effects. One, saving one's life, which is positive, and the other one is negative, which must come through for us to have the positive effect, which is slaying of the aggressor. You can kill the aggressor to save your life, according to Aquinas. It is not unlawful as it is natural to keep everyone in being as far as possible, which means self-defense is a natural law. That is why I call it the natural um, law um, ethics. That's the view of the natural uh, law ethics. And here, the argument is from what we call the natural theory of ethics, and it can be used to justify what we call therapeutic abortion. But now, Aquinas are given a condition under which the principle of double effect can be applied. And the condition is this. The objective of the person who is acting should not be the negative one. That is, you have, you have two intentions. You have, there are two consequences, positive and negative. Your intention should be the positive one, even though it will not happen without the negative one following. In the case of therapeutic abortion, it has been proven that the baby is located in the fallopian tube. That is what we call a topic pregnancy. Now, they are, they, if the baby is, if the is allowed to grow there, the mother will die. Then, there are two things you can do here. You have to save the mother's life, which is a positive um, intention or consequence. But saving the mother's life cannot happen without you killing the fetus. But if killing the fetus is happening because your intention was to save the mother's life, then we can say that abortion is morally justifiable by virtue of this uh, principle of double effect. And then, so then those were the views of the pro-abortionists. We now proceed to anti-abortionism, the pro-life thesis, those who think that we have to respect life in all its forms. And the first theory here, which defends, uh, which is against the practice of abortion or the moralization of abortion is what we call the divine command ethical theory. The divine command prescribes that what makes an action good is simply the respect of the will and the commands of God. That is, if you don't respect the will of God or the commandment of God, your action cannot be morally sanctioned. The principle of the sanctity of life is the principle on which this theory is, is built. And this principle holds that human life is precious, unique, 
irreplaceable and that no one has a right to take away the life of the other person. Life is sacred because it is created by God and we have a duty to respect life in all its forms. Therefore, God prescribes the respect of human life. We can see this, for instance, in the fifth commandment. He says, thou shalt not kill. Therefore, any act of abortion is against the principle of the sanctity of life or it goes against the divine command ethical theory. We also have the second argument against abortion, which is the view of the ontological ethics. This is an ethics of, of uh, Emmanuel Kant, and here it bases morality on the principle of universalism, which says that if you want to do good or, or to act, ask yourself if this act I want to perform now we are take, was taken as a universal law, will mankind have be happy? Will mankind be happy? If the answer is no to this principle, we should refrain from it. If the answer is yes, you can go ahead and perform the act. And this um, principle of universalism is somewhat related to what we call the golden rule in the church, which says, do unto others what you would like them to do unto you. And therefore, when we want to commit abortion, we should always put ourselves in the place of the fetish. We ask ourselves, if we were also aborted, like we want to abort abortion, we wouldn't have been existing today. And if anyone on earth engages on abortion, for instance, it will put an end to mankind. And also, the moral command here, that is under the ontological ethics, enjoin us to respect the intrinsic dignity of all human lives. Even if the fetus is sick of whatever illness, the, the, what is clear is that the human dignity is not defined by, is not something which is defined by the physical or the physiognomical aspect. Human dignity is something which is, is, it is intrinsic in the present and it is sacred because to this view, no one has a right to take away the, the life of the other person. We should treat human beings not as means to an end, but as an end in themselves. Don't use fetish or the fetus or human being for, for, to achieve your personal objective or because you want to save your pride, you kill a fetish. This is against the, the ontological ethical view. Now we come to the thesis of the virtue ethics, the virtue ethic thesis. Now, this is the ethics of uh, Aristotle, as we saw a while ago. The morality of the behavior can be deduced by examining the kind of moral character that such a behavior produces. That is, the question is this, for us to know whether an act is morally good or bad, the question we ask ourselves is that, does that act help to build the moral character of the person acting? If the behavior or the act produces virtue, then it is morally desirable, we can, we can allow it, we can tolerate it. It is morally permissible. If it produces vice, because virtue is a habit of doing good and vice is a habit of doing evil, if your act produces vice, then it is morally wrong. Abortion is not morally upright because it, is, it produces vice. Abortion is wrong because it produces moral character, which is characterized by what? By vice. And therefore, on the grounds of the thesis of the virtue ethics, abortion is morally wrong. We come to the fourth argument against the practice of abortion, which is the violation of the professional ethics. Every ethics or every profession or have or has their ethical code in which everybody working there are supposed to respect. And that constitutes also what we call the professional ethics. Here, medical doctors who violate their professional ethics when they connive with women to abort. That is, when you accept to abort with women as a medical doctor, you go against the code of conduct of medical doctors. And this is articulated by what we call the Hippocratic Oath. Because Hippocrates, being the father of medicine, created medicine for what for? To preserve and protect life in all its forms. And that is why medical doctors, before they take service, they always take this oath. The oath they take is, they take an oath to protect life, to preserve life in all its own. But when doctors connive with women to abort, they are going against their professional ethics 
And what that goes against ethics is wrong. And thus, on these grounds, we can argue that abortion is more rarely wrong. Now, dear students, this is the application exercise or the evaluation I propose to our lesson for today. And the question requires you to interpret this question. Is the fetus a moral person? Is the fetus a moral person? Now, the, this is the interpretation. This question can constitute an essay in the advanced level philosophy. That is, uh, you can have it as an essay in paper three. Now, for the thesis, we can use the view of the creationist. The fetus is a human person if we consider life as originating from the divine conception. That is, if life begins from the divine conceptions, then the fetus is a human being, because what we call theological determinism is holds that before a mother becomes pregnant, God has already predestined who that child was going to be. And if we go by this very fact, then we can conclude that even at the level of, at, even when a woman is just one day pregnant, the fetus is already a human being, and as such, this can constitute the thesis of this argument. Now, what about the antithesis? Is the fetus a moral person? Now, the fetus here cannot be a, a, a moral person if, if personhood is acquired after birth. That is, for those philosophers who think that, that there are conditions of being a moral person, and that those conditions can only be acquired after birth, like consciousness, like reasoning, like being responsible, like communication, language, and so on and so forth. Given that the fetus is not able to dispose herself of these conditions, then it can be argued that the, first, the fetus is not yet a moral person. And now, for the assignments you are going to do for our next lesson, dear students, you are going to construct an introduction for the question, is abortion morally justifiable? Is abortion morally justifiable? And just to indicate or to remind you that in essay writing in philosophy, part two or part three, the essay is written, it has three important parts, the introduction, the body, and the conclusion. And for the introduction you're going to write, it's always marked on five marks, wherein you have to begin by stating your background idea. The background idea is a general statement that takes you to the key concept here, which is abortion. Why do we have abortion? The answer to that question is, constitute your background idea. Now, you, have, you also have to do and that background idea is marked by one mark. You have now what we call the definition of key terms, which is marked by two marks. And the key term we have here, we, we, can def we are going to define abortion. We define what we meant when we say morally justifiable. What is the meaning of that? So you explain that. And the definition of key terms in, in essay writing in the introduction is two marks. And then in the next thing in your introduction is pro the problem stating. You state your problem. What problem does this question pose? What problem is this question posing? And the problem constitutes one mark of your introduction. And then the fifth part of the introduction now is what we call the problematic, which means you have to now ask an interrogative question that will conduct your essay, a question which, in which in the thesis you will say yes to that question, and in the antithesis you will say no to that question. So this is the assignment you're going to do for, your, for our next class. And for further readings, you can read The Dimension of Ethics, that is by Wilfred Walusho. You can read um, Philosophy, a text with readings by Manuel Vasque. You can read The Ethics of Abortion, Women's Rights, Human Life, and the Question of Justice by Christopher Castle. And um, dear students, the next lesson we're going to focus on the morality of euthanasia, war, violence, and terrorism. Una tege si, matege yop. Una tege minga, matege nyom. Una tege majang, matege ndom. Mane tambia niña ne injubia yen. Ngani bana, matege mot. Ngani la kiri watege ndong. Esa tina bia jinkido. Mane tambia niña ne injubia yen. Tam tama mote tam zabike. 
Tam tam tonge tam zabike tam 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 amote tam zabike mane tam bien ni nyane injo bien